Praise God. Y'all, y'all excited about Father's Day? Amen. Well, happy Father's Day, by the way, if there's some fathers in the house. Uh, before, amen. Amen. Uh, if you... Uh, if you're a father, then they got some gifts up here. It's well, it's just a little something, something, you know, just to let you know that we uh, that we're remembering Father's Day. Praise God. Well, listen, my message this morning is uh, it's a Father's Day message. A lot of times, you know, I'll just be I'll pray and I'll say, Lord, you know, give me a good father to preach on. But I felt like this morning that the Lord He wanted me to uh, to definitely focus on Him as our Father. But when it's all said and done, let me just get started this way. There's a scripture out of out of John chapter 14, and you know I'll refer to it quite a bit. But this, I guess you could say, would be my introduction to the message. Out of John chapter 14, Jesus is telling His disciples that He's about to go away. He's about to go away on a journey, you know, and uh, I guess there's a lot of different things that we could kind of pull in to the story. I don't want to overdo it, but, you know, y'all ever remember when your daddy used to go on a trip, right? Daddy used to go on a trip, he'd bring you back a gift. Anyway, let's not, let's not get too deep into that kind of stuff, but Jesus is about to go away, and he says, I'm going away to my father's house. He said, he said in my father's house, in the King James, it says there's many mansions. In the NASB, it says there's many dwellings. The idea is, is that Jesus was about to go away to the Father, and he wanted his disciples to understand that there was a, a time of preparation that was taking place for, for the people that were going to live for God, that were going to serve God, that, that he was going to prepare a place for them. Now, it is very interesting that Jesus in, on earth was a carpenter, and, but, but what he's talking about now is he's talking about he's going to build a spiritual habitation for eternity for for those that are going to serve the Lord. Amen. So he says, I'm, I'm going away to my father's house. He said, hey, I'm going away to my father. And in my father's house, there's many mansions. And if it was not so, I would not tell you. And, and he said, I'm going away, but I'm going to come back for you. And if that wasn't true, then I wouldn't be telling you what, I, what I'm telling you right now. And he said, he said, listen, I'm going away, but I'm coming back again to bring you, to bring you with me. And you know the way. So that's what he said. He said, and you know the way. And Philip says, we don't even know where you're going, so how in the world can we know how to get to where you're going to be? He said, no, you know the way, Philip. You know the way. You know the way, because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus made it clear, listen, I'm going away, I'm going to prepare a place, and, but you know how to get there. And even though Philip had been walking with him for all of this time closely with the Lord, he still did not completely understand. And I got to tell you that when we first come into our relationship with Jesus, many times we don't understand completely what, what the Bible's trying to say, but the Lord wants you to know that there is a way to get to the Father's house. There's a way to get to the Lord, amen. There's a way to spend eternity with with God. We're not sitting here, you know, for lack of better words, monkeying around on a Sunday morning and just going through the motions of just because it's Father's Day that we're coming to church. We're going to be here every week as long as the Lord tarries and he says so to try to remind people, listen, there's a real God out there and he's a father. He's a father and he is creating a family. And he wants you to be part of that family, and he wants your family to be part of that family. But guess what? He also wants the people you work with to be part of that family. He wants the people that you're dodging in Walmart to be part of the family. He wants everybody to be part of this family. As a matter of fact, he said in the, in the letter that, was, that Peter wrote to the church, Peter said, the Lord is long-suffering. Because he's waiting for one more to repent. I'm paraphrasing. He's long-suffering towards you. Because he's long-suffering towards the world. He's a merciful God. He's a compassionate God. Amen. I mean, when you hear that song, you're a good, good father. <laughs> it's who you are. You're a good, good father. Amen. Is that, is that hard for you to believe? I'm just curious. Is it hard for you to believe? That, the reason why I'm asking is because sometimes that's a hard thing for people to believe. Like, dude, the only father I know is the one I was raised with, and there wasn't a whole lot good about that. Okay. You know, I can tell you I was sitting there thinking while we were singing that song because it's a, it was a song about love, and it talked about the mercy and the compassion about love, and it talked about the father. 
And, you know, I was thinking, man, ha, you know, have you ever, and I'm not, maybe you haven't, but I'm just asking the question. Have you, was you ever embraced by your father, like in loving arms, just embraced by your physical father I'm talking about, you know? I can tell you that I personally never was. Okay, I'm not trying to, like, I ain't trying to have a little pity party for myself over here. I don't regret nothing, man. God has taken all the pain from the past, and he's turned it into something good because that's what God does. He takes bad stuff, and he turns it into beautiful stuff. Did I learn some stuff from my daddy that I'm grateful for? You better believe it, but that's another story. I never really experienced a compassionate, warm embrace that said, son, it's going to be okay. I know he was concerned about me. I don't want to get into all my life. I know he was concerned about me. He tried to do everything he knew to do, whether it was throw money at the situation or whatever, whatever, to try to help me. But I can't say that I ever, and I just think when we were singing the song about a compassionate father and a loving father and how, because I I do know that I've held my daughters in a warm embrace like that and to let them know, baby, it's going to be okay. I mean, it's some bad times, painful times. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm really, really stressful times. And holding them and letting them know it's going to be all right, baby. I love you and God loves you. Amen. And that's a beautiful, like, to me, I mean, I would, I mean, I'm kind of weird about stuff like that, but I'm just saying, like, to know that somebody cares about it, when it's genuine, it's good. You know, somebody's faking it till they make it. You don't want all that stuff. But, but when it's genuine, it's good, right? <laughs> But can I tell you that we can get confused and see in the modern church, we're kind of confused because we see songs like that. We're like, yeah, that's what love's supposed to always look like. Well, that is what, but the love of a father will also bring correction. The love of a true father will, and so sometimes we get skewed in our mind and our understanding of what God's love looks like. Let me tell you what God's love looks like. It looks like a naked Savior hanging on a cross and bleeding and dying to set you free from your sin. That's what the love of a father looks like. That's how much God the Father loves you. That's how much he loves me. It's like, man, I don't like going to church where they keep talking about sin and sinners. Well, then you need, you found the wrong place, my friend. Because the problem with the world is sin. And the problem with you and the problem with me is sin. Because sin still tries to get in the way of what God wants to do in our heart and in our lives. I didn't come here this morning to make you feel weird about yourself and where you are. God the Father doesn't want you feeling weird. Does he want you to feel convicted? Yes. Because he wants the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts and for us to line up with him. You know the word in confession, I share this with you all all the time, the word confession in the Bible. Confess your sins. Okay. That word in the Greek, I didn't, none of this is my notes. I'm just trying to make a point. Greek words use compound words, two words put together, homologia. Remember I've told you all that before? What does that mean, preacher? I was telling somebody at work this the other day, homa. So we kind of pronounce it homo, okay? But, 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 but what the word means, it means same. Homa, same, logia, speak. Same speak. What is that saying? When you confess your sins to the Lord, it means you're saying the same thing God is. So, so if God says it's sin... I need to get me a Bible up here. If God says it's sin in his word and you homologia, what you're doing is you're saying, yes, Lord, I realize these things in my life. Listen, you ain't got to worry about what I got in my life. You got your own stuff, right? You don't ain't worry about what your partner got in his life. You got your own stuff. So quit looking down our religious nose on our brothers and sisters in a condescending attitude. I'm not saying toot, 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 I'm not saying Amen. And when we start looking like Jesus, I'm telling you, it don't always look like what we look like. Right? Because Jesus was, he was kind and he was compassionate. He was humble. He, he came to do the Father's will. He didn't just buzz up. Oh, he, listen, he did. Let me correct myself. He did buzz up in the house. Did he not? He did. Because that was his father's house. <laughs> and he said, y'all done turned this into a den. Y'all, y'all are a den of thieves. And y'all done tried to take over and usurp the authority of my father. No, 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 no. And with righteous zeal, he did. He busted up in the house and he brought some correction because that's what God does. Amen. God wants to correct. He wants to set free. He wants to love. 
He wants, to, he wants to produce humility in our heart. He's a good, good father. So whenever I see this word father's house, I think of the story of Philip. And he's like, Philip, you, I'm going to the father, and you know how to get there. He's like, well, no, we don't even know where you're going. How are we supposed to get there? No, you know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, it, and, and, and no man comes to the father but by me. So if you're going to get to eternity, there's only one vehicle to get in. It's not a Tesla. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a BMW. His name is Jesus. And you got to get in Christ before you'll ever get to eternity. Amen? I want you to know that. And so that's, and, and really and truly when we're talking about the Father's house this morning, and I just really, in a broad, trying to paint a broad picture for you, I want you to know that the earth that we live on, again, I'm going to say it again, it's fallen. And, and the world is full of sin. And the world is full of rebellion. And evil, wicked, powerful men, right, are trying to exert influence through various types of media. Just the world in general. There's a spirit. Like, we're, we're a spiritual church. We believe in spiritual stuff. Okay, it's just not all about practicality. There's a spiritual war that's taking place. And what's really happening is, and I know I shared this with somebody yesterday, but a while back I think I shared this with y'all too. I'm driving down the road, and I'm thinking about, you know, Lord, I just want to be humble. Like, I know that my personality doesn't come across that way, but I know what you've put in my heart. And I really don't want to come across as some prideful, kind of like a, a bonehead that turns head, 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 that turns head. That turns head, 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 that turns to be a negative reflection on my father. I'm just telling you, that's why I use the word sorry so much. Because I'm concerned they're gonna take me the wrong way and it's gonna reflect on the father. Okay. At the same time, I am never sorry for telling the truth. Never, ever, 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 ever am I sorry. And if I am, it's the devil trying to lie to me and to make me feel bad. Or do you just say, oh, you can't do that in public. Oh, no, yes, I can, Mr. Devil, sir. I can do whatever the Lord commissions me to do. And so never am I sorry for telling the truth. Amen. But sometimes I'm sorry for the way I come across. Because I'm concerned that it's going to be misinterpreted and that my father in heaven is going to be misinterpreted. That's why. But so anyway, I was driving down the road that day, man, and the Lord was like, son, you ain't, you, you ain't got to say you're sorry. Now, if I say I'm sorry, again, I've already explained to y'all why I say I'm sorry. So don't come, oh, you said it again in the message. That's what people do. Because yeah, I've told this story before. You said you were sorry in the message. I'm going to keep saying I'm sorry. Okay, but this is what the, the Lord was speaking to me. And this is what the Lord said. You ain't got to tell nobody you're sorry, son. Because, see, this is my property. Oh. Now, come on a second now. <laughs> come on a second now. You, had, you didn't even get what I just said. This don't belong to nobody else but the Lord. You hear me? I'm talking about this rock we call earth. This is the Father's earth. This is the Father's creation. It belongs to him. It's, the devil has tried to steal what belongs to to God. I'm trying to introduce you to my father. And the way he introduced me to himself was he sent me his son. And the only way I'm ever going to see what he looks like, I'm going to have to go through the son. I'm here to tell you, you can break this down so many ways. The roads on this earth, as dirty as they are, they belong to my God. Listen, that place where my brother Robert owns peak roofing, ah, that little plot of land don't belong to Robert. That belongs to the Lord. The Lord let him have some of that right here on this earth. The little house House I live in on Hilda Street. I know but my, my name might be on the title. None of that belongs to me. It belongs to the Lord and you, my friend. You belong to God. You belong to the Father. And the Lord wants to take back what belongs to him. And that's the realm that we're living in. And everything that we go, in every direction that we go, in opposition to that, we give the enemy the opportunity to hold us in bondage and to take that real estate that belongs to God and take it over. And he's over there cackling and he's laughing and he's chuckling and he's like, I'm pulling them away from their God. I'm here to tell you that the Lord's got the last say so, my friend. So when I'm talking about the Father's house and I'm talking about Jesus going away to prepare a place, I'm talking about this big old plan that's been going on for thousands of years on this earth. I'm trying to describe to you that there is an enemy of God that's trying to pull people away 
from God. You understand? But that God loves you. Amen. And you can't get a better picture of love than the way he sent his son Jesus to die for us. That's a beautiful, beautiful picture of love. Amen. I don't know what you think when you see that. I don't even know why I got to keep on going with this kind of stuff. But when I was a young boy, I used to sit in the Catholic church. I was born and raised Catholic. And I can remember, and I might have even said this last week on Wednesday. Y'all forgive me. I'm getting old. But I used to sit in the Catholic church, and I'd look, probably seven, eight years old, and I'd look at that crucifix that they'd have up there. I'd think, man, what is the big deal, dude? There was parts where the Lord was speaking to me, and he would tell me to pray. I can tell you one time as a kid, I know it's kind of like weird because it's kind of pagan kind of thing. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I I had a desire to go dig a hole in the ground and put food in the ground for God. (laughs) But at the same time, it's like God was speaking to me. I was just a little boy. Just like I told you all that time, and I found that little temple on the side of the road in Singapore. And I went around that temple, and there was Buddha. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, that ain't even a real God. This is before my sister ever got saved. That ain't a real God. And I started knocking that thing down. I, just weird things like that where the Lord just showing up and speaking to my heart as a, as a, as a little uh, child. Amen. And I, I just lost my train of thought. Why did I have to? Uh, Lord Jesus. I was talking about when I was a kid. I don't even know. I don't even know where I was going with all this. Lord, huh? Somebody going to help me? Huh? Yes. That's an old moment. But anyway, praise God. It's all good. It's all good. The, pro, the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make is is that God was trying to reveal himself to me as a, as a young child, and he was trying to, to show me things uh, that, you know, that, that he was my father and that, and that he had a, a, a plan, amen, for my life, even as a young boy, you know. And uh, so anyway, we're living in the Father's house, amen, and this earth belongs to God, and, uh, and so we're going to serve him, and amen, he sent his son. All right, so the first thing I wanted to show you was this scripture right here. So Jesus said to them, Truly I, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. Now, I did not even plan on doing this, but this morning I was like, okay, Matt, well, you got to go back and you got to remind yourself what the context is here. Because I was just going to talk about just some basic things on this scripture. Okay, like for instance, is that not true? Like how many people in the house fish? How many people are fishermen? Come on, just rip, throw your paw up there if you like to fish. Okay, amen. All right. Did your daddy fish? I'm just curious. Shelby's daddy fish. All these people that fish, they say their daddy fish. Okay, guess what? My daddy didn't fish. All right. So many times a young man, when he's growing up in the home, he sees what his father's doing, right? And he learned. So look, if your daddy taught you how to fish, that ain't going to get you into heaven. But good news, you can, you're going, that's, a good, that's not nothing wrong with fishing. That's a good thing. You can feed yourself. You can feed your family. You can relax. That's good stuff. Fishing is good, right? The point is, is this, is that sometimes young men, young ladies, they watch what their father does and they do what their father does. And while that's a good thing, sometimes, sometimes it can be a bad thing, right? I mean, one thing that I can tell you was, you know, my, my poor old daddy, he, 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 as, as hard as he was, he had a drinking problem. And so he drank so much. I mean, and look, it's not important what, to get into all that. He had his own pains and his own heartaches, and he, he drank so much that more than likely if he was at the house, he was in a bad mood because he was coming, he was hungover. Okay. I can remember as a little boy, man, my daddy was a master, though, when it came to fixing stuff. Dude, tinkering with stuff, like little bitty pieces of mechanical stuff, and he'd tear it all down, and he'd fix it, and he'd put it all back together. And, I mean, he was a, and dude, like, you want to see the worst person ever with tinkering with stuff? And like and saving little nuts and bolts. I can remember he had little baby food jars with all of his extra nuts and bolts, like and everything was all organized and clean. And I can remember one time I was like, Oh yeah, daddy's home. Let me go out in the garage. What you doing, man? He's like, Get back in that house, boy. You know, he didn't want like he didn't want to be dealt with, he didn't want to be aggravated. And again, I'm not looking for a pity party. I'm just telling you it is what it is. But it's okay. I got some stuff from him that works for me. Like, you know, a little bit of toughness on the inside and learning how not to get my feelings hurt so much. You know, thanks, Dad. But guess what? I needed the Lord to smooth some of that stuff over. Cause if not, I'll be acting that way to other people. I'll be acting. I can remember telling Sierra one time she was going through some stuff. And, and I was like, kind of like fussing a little bit. 
I'm like, girl, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I go back in the room, and, I, and the Lord smoked my heart. And I went back in there, and I said, sweetheart, I just want to tell you something. God corrects, but he don't act like I just acted. He's not irritated with you. He loves you, you know? And sometimes in our own humanity, we get frustrated because we want to try to fix stuff. You understand what I'm saying? But really and truly, some things can only be fixed spiritually. And what we're supposed to be doing is trusting God to fix stuff spiritually. And, and, and you know, so I just went in there and I, I shared that with her. And my point is, I'm just trying to make the point that, that God is compassionate and he's loving and he's kind. Our Father is that. Amen? And, and sometimes, you know, you see this. Like, we see what our fathers did and, and, and the good stuff, you know, that we try to emulate or to do what our fathers did, the good things that they, that they taught us. Well, this is what Jesus is saying. He's having, a, he's having a kind of like a situation going on here because what happened in the beginning of this story in John chapter 5 is that the Bible says that there, were, there was a pool called Bethesda. And that around this pool, there was all kind of impotent folk. That's what, the, that's what the King James Version says. And the word impotent means they just ain't had no strength. They were weak is what it means. They were impotent. They were blind. They were halt. They were lame. The Bible says they were withered. Yeah, the word withered means that, that the word withered means is that your muscles have not been used for so long that they've atrophied and they don't even function properly anymore. So I don't know if you can get a picture of this or not, but there's all these sick folk that are laying around by the pool of Bethesda because every now and then an angel stirs the water and the first one that plops off in the water, he gets healed. Okay, but so that's a mess, dude. I mean, if you could imagine like some of these old war movies in a mass unit and all these people are injured, soldiers, right? This is a spiritual mass unit. The, 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 the effects of the fall on mankind. And here they are. They're blind. They're halt. They're, they're lame. They're withered. And they can't help themselves. That's you and I, my friend. That's you and I in a spiritual condition because of the fall and the fall of man. And, and some, of our, some of us don't look as bad as with other people, but, it does, but we all got something going on that we need, to, we need the Lord to heal. And so the Lord walks up to the, to the lame man. He had been lame 38 years. Listen, he had been in bondage for 38 years. But the Lord showed up. Listen, the world out there is hurting. The world out there is lame. They're halt. They're withered. They're blind. They can't see the truth of the gospel. They can't get up and they can't walk for the Lord. And they don't know what in the world is going on. And God wants to work through you. Jesus wants to commission you to go out there to let somebody know, just like Jesus said to the lame man, will you be made whole? That's the question that God's asking people this morning. Will you be made whole? I will, Lord, but every time somebody else beats me into the water, that's not what I came here to ask you. Will you be made whole? He said, I will, Lord. I want to be made whole. He said, then get up, stand up, rise up, pick up your bed, and walk. I didn't plan on getting into this story this much, but I think about all these things, and I know I've preached this before, but here's this man, and the Lord tells him, take your bed with you. He didn't say leave it there. So listen, there's a fine line between forgetting our past, but also remembering what the Lord delivered us from. He's carrying that thing, and listen, this is the, this is the most interesting thing of all. Again, I read the story, but I didn't pay close attention to all the details, so you can check me on this. But if I'm not mistaken, the whole mess that started it was because it was the Sabbath. I know it was the Sabbath. But I'm pretty sure the thing that got the religious people's eyes was that he was carrying his bed on the Sabbath. So my point to that is Jesus told him to carry his bed. So my point to that is that Jesus knew that he was going to fluster the feathers of the religious folk. Jesus said, pick up your bed and walk out of here, my friend. Okay, and, and, and listen, I want you to know that the Lord wants to set you free. He wants to set me free, and he wants us to be reminded of what he set us free from so that we'll give glory to him, but religion hates it. The world hates it. They don't mind you, and I didn't come in here to pick on whatever. I'm just going to tell you, they don't mind you going to AA. I know I said it probably something about it Wednesday night, but guess what? This is a good illustration. That's the only reason I'm bringing it up. 
They, the world does not mind you going to AA. The world does not mind you going to see the psychiatrist or the psychologist and laying on the sofa and taking your pill every day. Oh, you're preaching against my medicine. That's not what I'm preaching against. I'm trying to make a point. The world doesn't mind you doing all of those things. But, oh, Lord, help you if you start talking about Jesus outside, out loud in public. Lord, help you. Because all of a sudden, in the spiritual realm, it starts causing all kind of shaking going on. Because the spirits don't like the name of Jesus. Because there's power and authority in the name of Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the cross, hallelujah, he threw his blood, paying the penalty for sin because he had no sin. And the wages of sin is death. And when Jesus died, he didn't die for his own sin. He died for your sin. He died for my sin because he had no sin. And the Bible says that when he died, hallelujah, he nailed the law to the cross and he tried triumphed over the spiritual wickedness that we experience on this earth through his death, and he has now given that power and authority to you and I. We ain't got to live like that lame man anymore, my friend. Religion may not like it. The world may not like it, but I'm going to tell you right now, the world ain't got me where the Lord's got me, and I ain't going to depend on them. By his grace, listen, I got a long way to go, my friend, but I know one thing, the Lord has convinced me of himself. And I'm going to keep on by his grace living for him, talking about him. And whoever will listen, I'm going to tell him, God is good. <laughs> He's a good, good father. It's who he is. Hallelujah. Amen. It's who he is. It's his nature. And he wants to be good to you. And he wants to heal you of your disease, whatever that is. Whether it's an anger problem, whether it's an addiction problem, whether it's a lust problem, whether it's a this problem or a that problem or, you know, you got to go through the whole list or else people don't think you're talking to them. Whether it's an internet pornography problem, whether it's an adultery problem, whether it's an alcohol, a drug problem, whether it's an anger problem, bitterness, lying, cheating, stealing. I don't care what your disease is. He wants to heal you. And the healing has to start with us even coming to the realization that we need healing. Amen. Because if we're sitting in a church where they're telling us, that, oh, no, 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 everything's fine, don't you, even, don't you even say that you need to repent. That's that whole new, that's a bunch of garbage, bro. Okay, am I allowed to say his name, Joseph Prince? That's a bunch of garbage, bro. Is it, is, I'm just going to call it like it is. I don't care how, how eccentric he looks. I don't care if, if, if he wears nice-looking clothes. I don't care if they got a groovy little green screen behind him when he's talking. I don't, none of that matters to the Lord. If you Listen, they like, don't say nothing about sin or ask for forgiveness of sin because you've already been forgiven. And if you think about sin, now you're becoming sin conscious. And so all you're going to do is sin. No, that's a lie. The first thing you got to do is you got to come to grips with the reality that if something's wrong in your heart, then you would repent to the Lord. And, you, and listen, the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 that with repentance comes great refreshing. Repentance means, that, hey, listen, my heart wants to turn, Lord. A homology, I say the same thing you say, Lord. Help me. Help me to turn, oh, Lord. Because guess what? We got to realize the enemy is on our back and he ain't giving up. But look, he says, I, I, and then the religious leaders come up. They find out, who told you to carry your bed and walk? He's like, I mean, I don't remember this story exactly, but they figured out it's Jesus. And so they, they, now they're, they're investigating and can you imagine these religious people walking around? You ever seen a person with a religious spirit? It's like, dude, I ain't got no, I ain't got no time for your games, bro. I done seen it. I done, I've done, I've been under its spell. I'm not going to walk under a spirit of religion. I'm not going to sit under a spirit of religion. The Lord brings freedom and liberty. Amen. And as we walk and grow and learn together, we're going to learn. Because guess what? This preacher ain't got everything figured out. But I can tell you one thing. I want to understand what's going on. And as long as it's lining up with the Word of God, I'm all for it. Let's do it. But it needs to line up with the Word of God. And we need to be in unity. Amen? And then we might see book of Acts. You never know. Hallelujah. Because the Lord wants the book of Acts, my friend. All right. So he only does what he sees his father do. And what does his father do? His father sends healing. His father sends restoration. His father sends love. And his father sends compassion. His father sends Jesus to make the world right. Listen, we can sit here for a long time. His father, 
his father has been working for thousands of years just to get to the point where he sends Jesus. I mean, if you think about all the work the father did just to get us to this point, I mean, that's what we don't understand in the Bible. That's why we can't wrap our brain around the big plan of God. Listen, I know I've shared it so many times. God called a man named Abraham out before there was ever even a nation called Israel. He called, told that man to come out of Iraq. Come out of your daddy's house, and I'm going to make a nation out of you. And through Abraham, we have Israel, and through Israel, we got Jesus. That's 4,000 years of human history right there. It's written in the Bible. Right there, boom. Three seconds. You got 4,000 years of human history. And it's all one plan. God was working, my friend. If you knew all the little stories in the Old Testament that got us to that point, to see what God did and all the work he did to get us to the point where the world was ready to receive Jesus, so that, so that Jesus could be told to the hurting and, the, and, and those that are lame so that they could be healed. Jesus said, you're, you're getting all caught up in this, but I only do what I see my father do. I'm just doing what the, Lord, what the father told me to do. And then Jesus goes on to say this in the next verse. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. You know, it's a beautiful thing, too, because Jesus told his disciples at one point, he said, I don't even call you friend, uh, servants anymore. I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't really know what his master's doing. See, the Lord wants Jesus, the Father tells Jesus what he's doing. Jesus submits to the Father's will and does the work that is required of him. Jesus reveals the Father's will to his disciples, to his friends, to those that are really on the team. And what he's revealing to those of us that are on the team is that, yes, he wants people set free. But why does he want them set free so bad? It's so that others can hear the good news of the gospel and that they too can be set free. Amen? So the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. In John 1 and 12, he says, but as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So whenever uh, the reason I'm transitioning to the concept of the sons of God is because this morning's message has to do with the Father's house, the Father's plan. We understand that there's a spiritual family in place, that the Father sent his son, his only begotten son. And I don't want to get into this too deep, but you know, there's references in the Old Testament to the, son, to the sons of God. We've been studying that on our little off night, by the way. We have in class tonight at 5 o'clock, if you can make it. Sons of God. So the Bible refers to the angels in the English as sons of God, but it also refers to Israel. He called Israel his first born. And then in the New Testament, we hear that Jesus is the one and only begotten or unique son of God. And then now we hear that believers who believe in the message that Jesus brought have become the sons of God. So what we're seeing is a family. Again, we got the father, we have the son, and now those that are willing to believe the message of the son and to embrace it, they themselves become sons and become part of this bigger family. Now, I did want to bring you to this right here, though. John, let's read this a little bit more closely. John chapter 1, starting in verse 6. And I want you to see the witness John, John the Baptist. Right, Because I want you to know what the plan of God is and what God's doing is he's sending messengers to tell other people about this plan. And so, you know, you remember John the Baptist, y'all heard of him before. Let's just take a little quick back, back story. And let, the Bible says that John, the Bible says that in the year that, and, and I might be getting the names wrong, but Annas, and I'm shooting from the hip, Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. That never really happened very often. For some reason, there were two high priests that year. Okay. Well, what's interesting is that John comes from the lineage of the tribe where the priests come from. It says, in the year that Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the spirit of the Lord came to John. <laughs> Dude, that's just too good. What, what are you trying to say? I don't, I'm not even catching it. What I'm trying to say is, is all these big old churches that people are calling religion, that everybody's congregating to, 
okay? They're all thinking that they're getting a hold of something. And what I'm trying to tell you is the Spirit of God is bypassing that. And he's bringing himself to people like you that might be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to come to you. He bypassed over religion and he rested on John the Baptist. And the Bible says John the Baptist was dressed with camel's hair and a leather belt girded around him. He ate honey and locusts. And one time, Aaron and I were talking to a brother from our old church, and he's like, well, I don't believe that he was eating real locusts. It was a locust bean because, because the locust was unclean. And Aaron said, well, let's go check this out. I mean, that was way back. You probably might not even remember, but I remember stuff, man. And we were in your, you was when you lived with me. And we, we pulled out our Bibles, boy, we were looking. And what we found was in Leviticus, no, you can eat locusts. It's clean. And we're like, well, there you go. Boom. So he had locusts hanging off his beard is what I'm trying to tell you. He was wild, and he was full of fire, and he was full of passion, and he was commissioned by the Father to prepare the way for the Son because there's a king coming. And when the king is coming, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Prepare the path. Let it be known straight as the path that leads for, for the Lord, and the Lord's coming to show us. Amen. And this is what John, he said, there came a man, he was sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light. Jesus is the light. We live in the midst of a darkened world, but Jesus is the light. That all, listen to me, look, can I do this? All, boom, highlighted. That all might believe through God the Father has a plan. He's sending his son Jesus. He sent John to prepare the way, and he gives a witness to the light. He was not the light. John the Baptist was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. You know, I wanted to think about this. I had a plan, and I always forget stuff that I want to do, but it's like... Here we go. I don't know if I'm even going to be able to do it because I'm so short. I'm, why, am I, why did I have to be so short? Y'all laughing at me. Huh? It's okay. Look. Boom. There it is. So the light's off. The light is off. But John the Baptist came to bear witness of the light and that if you would receive the light, this light enlightens or brings light to every man. There's people that are out there walking in the world that you live in, in the people that you're interacting in, and they're walking in the dark. They have not been enlightened. The light bulb has not come on. The Spirit of God is not living in their heart yet, but he can. He can, and he's sending you out like a little John the Baptist. You might not be walking around with locusts in your beard. Thank God. But nevertheless, you might not even be weird like me. Thank God. But nevertheless, God's going to send you where he's going to send you, and he's going to use you. It might just be a simple thing. Like, preacher, I ain't never going to look like you. Thank God. But he might, he might calm you down. <laughs> and you might be talking to somebody that says, man, I've been going through this, and you might be able to say, I've been through that before. I've been through that before, and some crazy preacher guy was, had this church, and somebody from their church told me about Jesus, and I went and visited, or I got on my knees, I got saved, and now God's been working in my life. He can do the same thing for you, my friend. And whenever they say, okay, well, tell me how to know this Jesus, and they say, Lord, come in. I want to be part of what you're doing. Guess what happens? He enlightens every man. He enlightens every man. He wants all to be enlightened. He wants all to have the light bulb come on. He enlightens every man. Now they're no longer walking in darkness. Now there's another light. Can you imagine a dark world? <laughs> Can you imagine if you just saw a dark world? I'm not trying to do, get you to do some kind of like guided imagery. That's weird st psychological stuff. But I'm just trying to say, can you imagine a, a picture of a dark globe? And then God sends Jesus to the earth, born of a virgin, light in the midst of darkness. And then Jesus dies on the cross, and the first person to believe. Well, John the Baptist's disciple, John, was one of the first ones. John and Andrew, Peter's brother, first ones to believe. Boom, two lights come on. 
Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter. We found him, we found him, we found him. And boom, another light comes on. And then they, then they go find Philip in, in, in Galilee where they were from. They were fishermen from the same town. Boom, another light comes on. And then they find, then they find Bartholomew underneath the fig tree. Boom, another light comes on. And then it's just like spreading. The light's spreading over the globe. Light's coming on everywhere. People coming to, to know God. Amen. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Now we're talking about Jesus. It's okay. Things happen. And the world w- w- was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. And these who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. He's giving you the right to become his child. Amen. And all you got to do is receive the son he sent. Amen. So that's kind of part of where I'm going with this message right there. But look, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through verses 4 through 1. Because listen, as we're transitioning and as we're understanding that this message or this word is talking about a father, a loving father that's full of compassion, and that he would love us enough to send his son, amen, to die for us, that, that also in this story, that love is going to be transitioned into you and I as believers and as sons of God. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? I hope it does. So let's take a look. We're going to look at these four verses real quick, and, uh, and then we're going to close. We're going to close, though, with some worship, and I want you to know I'm going to invite you to the altar Today, if you need prayer, amen, uh, Ms., uh, Sister Brenda, Pastor Kirk are here, and I'm going to be here, and we can pray for you, whatever you're going through, amen, and other people can pray for you, and we're going to believe God to minister to your heart and your life today, amen. If you want prayer, I'm just letting you know the altars are open, and it's available for you. Um, okay, so look, look at this. I'm, we're going to look at that one. We're going to look at Hebrews, two passages out of Hebrews, and we're, then we're going to also close with a passage out of Romans, okay? So let's take a look real quick at Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Look at this. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, what I want you to know is I want you to imagine this in your mind that Jesus is going in. He told John the Baptist before this, he said, no, all righteousness must be fulfilled. So Jesus went through this process of baptism. Now, sometimes people get caught up in a lot of this, but I want you to know that this was a time frame that was changing in the life and towards the ministry of Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus didn't have to be baptized because he needed to be cleansed because he had no sin. But Jesus was about to be launched into a new part of his life. What I'm saying is is that up until this place, he had been prepared, he had been spoken to, but now he was about to move truly into his purpose. Does that make sense? And so this baptism is a transition in his life. And and whenever, whenever he's baptized and this transition takes place, what ends up happening is, is that is that God the Father saying, This is my son, and in him I am well pleased. Amen? I've shared it with the congregation before, but when I first read that, after the Lord started getting a hold of me, the Lord said, Matt, I'm not well pleased in you by yourself. Let me just say it like that. But when you're in him, I'm well pleased with you. Because, see, this is my plan. This is my plan, and when you say yes to my plan, now I can be well pleased with you. Amen? So he said, this is my son, and I'm well pleased. What I want you to know is, is that whenever you give your heart to the Lord... It's kind of like this shift is changing. For Jesus, he didn't have sin, so it's, a little, so it's different. But at the same time, he's moving into the plan that God the Father has for his life. And when you get born again, you're taking the first step to move into the plan that God has for your life. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? And then when you get baptized, you're signifying publicly that, you're, that that's what you're doing. You're identifying yourself in your new life with Jesus Christ. 
But look what happens next. Because see, listen to me, Christian. As soon as you give your heart to the Lord and you begin to desire to move in his purposes, just like what happened to Jesus is going to happen to you, the temptation of the Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Because you see, Jesus was walking on the earth and he said, I am the one that was sent. And so guess what? If you're going to say you're the one that was sent, you're going to be tested. Because see, God does everything judiciously. He's given the devil his time. One day the devil ain't going to have no more time and everything that God did was going to be righteous and pure. And, and he's being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now listen to me, you, gotta, you can't get confused because there's a difference between being led by the Spirit into the wilderness and us opening up the door to sin. But I will say this. God will use sometimes the mistakes that you and I make in our life to bring chastisement. God's not, will is not for you and I to be in bondage to demonic spirits. No, that's why, G, that's why he sent Jesus to set us free. That's why Jesus won the victory. But sometimes when we open the door and we think that we're ready to be set free, we ain't even really, really ready. We're not really ready to be set free because we're still kind of liking it. Yeah, am I allowed to talk like that? Am I allowed to preach like that? Because, see, sometimes our flesh still likes certain things. And we have not been convinced in our spirit yet, so we're not really ready to let go of that thing yet. Whatever that thing is, you don't, I'm not going through all that naming stuff again. You figure out between you and the Lord, whatever that is. Okay, but I'm telling you right now, anytime you're sitting in a church service and you start feeling irritated because you feel like the preacher's like poking on you, can I tell you that's probably demonic What I'm trying to tell you is the same way that I was sitting in the church that night in Berwick, Louisiana, and that woman kept talking about the blood, and I started feeling irritated, started feeling frustrated, and I almost got up and walked out. The devil was trying to prevent a moment that was about to happen in my little life, and it's going to happen to you too. I can guarantee you, you're going to feel irritated at times, and you're going to try to blame it on me, and sometimes it'll be partially my fault. Because I still don't know how to act. But it ain't always my fault. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit dealing and the enemy frustrating. And the enemy's like, oh, no, I got to get him out of here. I got I to gotta get her out of here. I got to stick some earplugs in their ear. I got to make them quit. Don't listen to this. Cause something to happen. Cause a distraction. Don't, no, 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 no. I got to do all this stuff because I can't let them hear this truth. Because they, they're just on the brink right there of something about to happen in their life. So he was led into the wilderness. My point being is this, is that the Lord knows how to lead and guide us, and the Lord knows how to clean us up. And sometimes even though we open up doors and we allow things in, I want you to know God wants you free. But at the same time, God's going to use this thing in your life, and he's going to convince you that you want to be free. And when it's all said and done, you're going to be the better for it. Because God causes all things to work together for good to those that love the Lord. Amen? All right. So that's that, that's that first scripture right there that I wanted you to see. Amen. I wanted you to see that scripture there. Now where we, where we say we're going next, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, I believe it was 8. All right, so now we're talking about, see, the Father sent his Son because he loves us. And as soon as the son moves forward in his plan, the testing comes, right? And now we're talking about you and I that have received the message of Jesus, and now we're becoming the sons of God. And there's things in our life that God wants to deal with, all right? And so now the author of Hebrews is letting us know about Jesus. Look at this. He says, although he was a son he learned obedience. You know, when I was a novice in the scriptures, I didn't really understand what this meant. I was like, you mean Jesus was a bad boy when he was growing up? He had to learn obedience? He was disobedient to Mary? He was disobedient? No, Joseph, I don't want to nail that table together. I mean, no. Like, you go find somebody else. Go ask that other kid. Like a little, no, no, no. 
What it's saying is, is that as the unique son of God who had no sin in him and was different than every other son of God that would ever walk on the face of the earth, he himself did not know sin, and therefore he never sinned. I'm telling you right now, dude, you'd love to have a son like Jesus, right? You'd love to have a son like Jesus because whatever it is that his father told him to do, he came to do it. And he wasn't all high and mighty and self-righteous about it. He was like, what, what do you need me to do, father? Okay, and, and, and so though he was a son, though, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, meaning if he has to be obedient, obedience is a good theory when he's the word of God or the eternal son before he's ever in flesh. I know I'm getting deep, but come on now, work with me. You are, you are going to be the obedient son of God, and we're going to send you to earth, and that sounds so beautiful in heaven whenever everything's pristine and pure and untainted. But then now he becomes flesh on a fallen earth. And so now he has to walk through it. That's what it's saying. He learned the process of obedience by suffering through and performing what the Father's will was. Amen? Does that make sense? And he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Hallelujah. He went through the trial. He endured. He performed the Father's will and ultimately even to the cross where he died for you and I. And because he was faithful, amen, we can be found in the faithful one. And when we're found in the faithful one, and he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased because you're in him, he's saying the same thing to you, my friend. I want you to see real quick Hebrews chapter 12. I'm not going to keep you too much longer. Just bear with me. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. Now we're transitioning. We just talked about the endurance of the Lord, his learning of obedience. Now we're in Hebrews 12 verse 7. And what the Lord wants you to understand is this, that it is for discipline that you have to endure. See, sometimes we go through the trials of life and we find the Lord is bringing discipline to our lives and we don't understand why and we get frustrated. But no, you got to learn how to endure, Christian. If you, if you think that this is just some little, uh, you know, sit by the campfire, sing kumbaya, roast marshmallows we got the wrong picture of what the church really is we're in the middle of a battleground and the enemy does not want you to be free the enemy wants to hold you in bondage so it is for discipline that you endure look at this god deals with you as with a son see that's what i'm trying to tell you sometimes we get confused of what the love of god really looks like i agree that that there can be a compassionate embrace from the father's arms and look nobody give a hug like the father Nobody can give a hug like Jesus. I've felt it before. What, what, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm telling you, when my sister killed herself tragically, and I became broken like a little baby curled up in my bed and experienced the heartache and the torment and the pain. I can remember being on my living room floor. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just telling you with snot coming out my nose and groaning from deep down inside of my belly. And then God just healing me and ministering to me and loving on me. And like only God can do would change tragedy and turn it into triumph. That's what God. But in, but in order for me to be able to experience that, for me personally, I'm not saying that everybody else got to go through that because all of us are different. But for me to be able to come to the place of breaking that needed to be broken in me, I had to, I had to suffer because I was, yeah, whatever, I was in bondage, whatever the case. We could, there's a lot we could talk about, and maybe one day we will, but right now we're going to move forward, all right? God deals with you as he does with a son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, we're talking about right discipline. There's a lot of wrong discipline in the dad, right? I mean, I'm just saying, I always use my dad. He was a big influence in my life. I'm sorry if y'all get tired of hearing about my dad, but, you know, something would happen, and he would, he would look at me so disgusted, like if, I, like if I was hurt or like I would, like, look like I was about to cry because I fell and hurt myself or something. He would just look at me with this disgusted look. Like, and I won't even tell you some of the names he called me because... He said, I'm about to pluck you in the head, and, and you're going to forget real quick about whatever just happened. So you better suck it up. Okay, I know. 
That's why I act the way I do. Y'all got to pray for me. <laughs> but I'm getting more compassionate every day. Amen. I do thank God, though, that, you know what, I grew up in a time whenever America, it meant something to be patriotic. I thank God that I grew up in a time whenever people that worked hard for grades got A's and people got B's and C's. And I thank God. And you know what, it ain't, it ain't Mr. Oye, my principal's fault at L.J. Alamon that I didn't do the work and that I started off in advanced math and ended up in basic math. It's nobody else's fault but Matt Bear, because he in his own little world, he was hurting, but he didn't do the work. And when you don't do the work, then you don't get rewarded. I'm grateful that I grew up in a time like that. Whenever the winner gets a trophy, come on, somebody. The winner gets a trophy. Not everybody doesn't just get a trophy just to participate. No. I thank God that those are some of the things that the Lord, and, that the Lord through my dad or the Lord fixed through my dad and instilled in me. I, I thank God for the understanding that, you know what, if you want to be the best one on the job, you got to show up and you got to be ready to get it done. I thank God that now I have an understanding about being the best employee that is bigger than just me getting a raise, but that it's a reflection on my God. I'm going to go up in here and I'm going to talk about this, that, and the other thing, and I'm going to talk about Jesus. But look, when it gets time and the patients start rolling through, by the grace of God, I'm going to be the one with the endurance. And, and I ain't going to look 55 when I'm doing it, by the grace of God, right now in this part of my life, right? I ain't going to look 55 when I'm doing it. Right now where I am, the Lord's going to show up. I want to be a witness, and guess what? I'm going to be a witness right there when I'm clicking on that computer. Come on, bring on the next one, bro. I can do this in between. And look, we're going to do it. And, 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 and whenever, you, if I get a moment, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. If the Lord opens the door, because I ain't going to try to make it happen no more either, because I done learned that don't work. All right. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? But look, if you are without discipline, of which you have all been become partakers, then you are an illegitimate child. See, that's another thing about the love of God that we don't understand. Do you like being corrected? I'm going to tell you right now, I learned the hard way in my job where I am now. I've been there 25 years. They cut me in half. It's another story, but I've been there 25 years. One time, some people were lying about me, but I wasn't perfectly right. The Lord, dude, the Lord knows how he will, he will break you down, bro. You might, try to, you might try to state your case, but the Lord's get Matt, what are you doing? Nevertheless, there were some people that didn't like me, probably for a good reason because, you know, the Lord's changed me. <laughs> Thank God. I've humbled myself to those people. But anyway, and they were telling on me, saying that the clinic was backed up because I was late and blah, 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 blah. Long story short. Whenever the boss came to talk to me, he said, Matt, from now on, you can't leave the clinic till the last nurse has done her last piece of work. And so at the time, he had just given me this big raise, and he had just told me about how I was the most productive provider in the whole clinic. All right? So I'm on the heels of that. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I'm productivity man. And he comes in here with this little message. I'm like, <laughs> Does he forget that I'm productivity man? <laughs> and so I said, that may not work for me. And he went, I'll never forget it. He went, like, there's the door. If you can't comply, if you can't humble, and he didn't say all this, but this is what the Lord would say. If you can't comply and you can't humble thyself, there it is, Mr. Productivity. You can get productive as you walk out the door because this was his business. And this is the way he was going to say it needed to be done. So I'm driving down the road, and the Lord's like, you know what, Matt? That's not completely true exactly what they said. Because they said that it was your fault that the clinic was running behind because of the fact you were coming back late from lunch. Reality is, is that you were coming back from late from lunch. They got a big old onslaught of patients. You cleared them all out. Another big old onslaught of patients came on, and y'all were running late. So it wasn't really your fault. But let's deal with what was your fault. You showed up late to work. You showed up late to work. So let's just go ahead and deal with what was your fault. And you and me have a little sit down because I could care less with that. No, you're going to get yourself right because if you get yourself right with me, you're going to be right on the job, my friend. Because you're going to do the right thing because you're allowing me to speak into your life. As soon as I got done with that conversation, the doctor calls me back up. He's like, you know, man, I was thinking... I don't really want to hold you accountable to a standard that I myself don't live by. And, and listen, 
Matt, you, you just go ahead and you show up when you want, but I need you to understand something, that if my patients are waiting, that that's a problem. I'm like, okay. <laughs> wow. So anyway, through the years, I have learned to try to show up on time. <laughs> Amen? Because that's what the Lord wants me to do. Anyway, discipline. See, God has a way of doing things, but what I wanted to tell you was, I didn't even tell you this, whenever he did his shoulder like that, Oh, I felt it. It came way deep down inside, and dude, the frustration started to build up, and I could tell that my face was getting red, and I came this close to making a decision that would have changed, altered my life. I came this close to telling him how the cow eats the cabbage, like they used to say, whatever that means. How the rubber meets the road. That close. That close. And you know what I learned through all of that is, Matt, you don't like correction because nobody likes correction. But guess what? As your father, that's part of what I've called, been called. To, that's what I'm doing because I love you and I want to correct you. So just understand that sometimes, you know, and too, also, look, we're just talking right now because this is a good moment to say it. But you know how it says you don't war against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places? Sometimes whenever, like your boss might be a tyrant. And when he corrects you, he might act like a bonehead. I don't know. But you got to understand, you're not in a warfare with flesh and blood. The, the, and so the enemy might try to use your boss to beat you down. But the God that loves you with everything that's in him, that's in his son Jesus, just wants to teach you something through it. And if you will be willing to humble yourself and learn what your father is wanting to teach you, he will heal you, and if he don't want you having to put up with that anymore, he'll give you a promotion somewhere else so fast it'll make your head spin. You understand what I'm saying? But he ain't going to move on your behalf till he gets across to you what the business he wants to get across to you and the discipline he wants to give to you. And if you and I, I'm talking about me, or if me wants to remain prideful, his word says, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will exalt you. So humble thyself. When you feel pride rise up and anger rise up and you know that it's pride, start to recognize it. Say, you know what? That's the old dirty devil trying to cause that to rise up in me. I want to humble myself and learn at the feet of Jesus. Amen? So you'd be an illegitimate child if the Lord didn't, didn't correct you, right? Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good. Look at this. This is so beautiful. Is this not good? Look at this. So that we may share his holiness. Well, what does that mean? It means that you and I got a bunch of stuff in us that doesn't look like Jesus. And so God is going to allow certain things to take place on earth so that he can bring correction to us, so that we can learn to call upon the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to change us and to, and, and to correct us. And that the more this process takes place, the more we're going to share in his holiness. Listen, here's the scripture. Y'all get ready, singers and musicians, we're about to close, uh, and the altars are going to be open. If you need prayer, we're going to go out of this place worshiping the Lord, though, and whatever you need, if you have a need, we're going to pray for you. Amen? But look, discipline is what the Lord says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, look at this, to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Man, there is so much in this scripture. You know what my problem is? My problem is I want to unpack every detail. And I think I got four scriptures on here, and I'm going to keep you all here for 30 minutes and now we're, 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 an hour, we're probably an hour and ten minutes into this thing. But look, I'm going to try to be careful with this. But I want you to know something. God had a predestined plan. He was going to send Jesus. And in this plan, guess what? His children called by his name are molded. That's what that word conform means. It means to be molded into what? To the image of his son. See, as you continue to walk with God, listen, you, I just showed up a week ago, preacher, or or three months ago, preacher, cut me some slack. Oh, we're going to need to cut you some slack because guess what? The preacher can't clean nobody up. It's the Lord going to clean you up. I'm just trying to encourage you to let you know you got to keep on coming back. You got to keep on trusting in the Lord. You got to keep on growing in Christ. And as you do, guess what's going to happen? It's like the Lord. I said it a while back. I preached it. He's got you on the potter's wheel. 
And you're like that piece of clay. And he's molding you. And he's conforming you. He's changing you on the inside. Now listen, Christian, if you've been, oh, Brad Bullock preached a message one time. It was talking about the baby sipping milk. He said, you're carnal. Paul told Corinthians, you're carnal. And you're still sipping milk when you should be eating meat. And I'll never forget, Brad Bullock said, sometimes you got people in the church 20 years. And you got to part the whiskers to put the bottle in their mouth. Dude, how do you come up with something like that? I don't know. Did he just not just say a lot right there? You got to part the whiskers to put the bottle in their mouth. They just like a baby sitting in a diaper with a big old beard, wah, wah, not really growing up, still acting the same old way. Their behavior, they're still acting like a two-year-old, but they've been in the faith 30 years. You're, the behavior of the believer, whenever another person comes, like, oh, well, he still does this. He still does that. He don't love the Lord, and we look down on them with our condescending, self-righteous attitude. Park the whiskers to stick the baba in the mouth because you ain't supposed to be self-righteous at this point. You're not supposed to be full of religion at this point. You're supposed to be humble and kind and compassionate like your father because you're supposed to be being conformed into the image of his son. And Jesus is loving on people. Jesus is dying for people. Jesus is hanging naked in the middle of the noonday sun. And he is saying after they've blindfolded him, stricken him, and spit on him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we people coming up in the church and we treat them like, like they're less than. And that we've arrived to some spiritual superiority. No, ma'am, no, sir. That's not the will of God. That is not the heart of Jesus. Jesus is comely and lowly, and he comes into town riding on a donkey and the foal of a, of a donkey. And he's born in a manger. And he's not dressed in silk clothes like normal kings do. He's, he's soft, and he, but at the same time, he's so strong. <laughs> He's at the same time, he's so strong with one word, they all fall out under the power of God. You understand what I'm trying to say? You're being conformed into the image of his son. Amen? You and I are being conformed into the image of his son. Let's close with that. Singers, musicians, as they're coming to make their way up here, we're going to close out in worship. I want you to know the altars are open. Amen? And we would love to pray for you if you need prayer for anything. If you feel like you're going through things, if you need a healing in your physical body, if you feel like you're being tormented by the enemy, whatever you're going through, if you feel like, you, you know, you can't get, we want you to come so that we can lay hands on you and pray for you. Amen.